The person might say, I love coffee, I love Man United, and I love the Lord God as well. But it's to be hoped that in each of these instances, that person does not mean the same thing when he or she uses the word love. To say I love coffee means I find it pleasant to the taste and enjoyable. To say I love Man United means I'm a fan. I'm fully invested in and interested in the outcome of their games. I may even have their merchandise. But to say I love God, well that's something entirely different again. Because it means that I understand how vital God is for me. That he loves me first and that I owe him my full heart, allegiance and worship. In the modern day usage in the English language, the word love has been considerably impoverished so that it has come to be used as a strong way of saying I like or I'm interested in something or someone. But in today's reading, the word love is meant in a very specific way. The word used in the original Greek of the text is agape, which is no ordinary love. It is the highest form of love, a love that is sacrificial in nature. Jesus himself lays out what it means when he says, A man can have no greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. Now that's a tall order, but Jesus himself goes beyond even that. He is fully God and fully man, and he lays down his life not just for his friends, but for his enemies. St. Paul tells us that Christ died for us while we were still in our sins. In fact, the love he shows and offers is the very thing that brings us into friendship with him. As St. John in the second reading tells us, this is the love I mean, not our love for God, but God's love for us when he sent his son to be the sacrifice that takes our sins away. God's love always has primacy, always comes first. God always makes the first move in love towards us. I think we're pretty familiar with what Jesus reminds us in the Gospels. When he, he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? He says that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul and all our mind. And he immediately links that with another commandment, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. In today's gospel, Jesus formulates that as, love one another as I have loved you. In this short passage in the gospel today, Jesus mentions love, I think it's nine times, and each time he uses the word agape, meaning a love that is willing to roll up its sleeves and make itself uncomfortable for the one who is loved. So I'd like to look at a couple of things about love that Jesus has to say. I've already mentioned his urging us to love one another and to love in a sacrificial way. Now I want to focus on these words. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. And then Jesus speaks about joy. He says that your joy may be complete. Jesus tells us to love one another as he has loved us. And then he tells us that as the Father has loved him, so he has loved us. How has the Father loved him? With a love that is so mighty, so pure, so holy, so immense and eternal, that it is a person. It is the Holy Spirit who is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. The Father loves the Son in the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit. Eternally, God the Father pours out the love of the Holy Spirit upon God the Son. And God the Son responds in that same movement of love towards the Father. The interior life of the Blessed Trinity consists in this eternal exchange of that beautiful love. 
And this God who is love, he loves us first. It is the same Holy Spirit of love who is poured out upon us in Christ. Now we are not eternal and we are certainly not God. But we are the recipients of that same love of God poured into our hearts, as St. Paul tells us in the fifth chapter of his letter to the Romans. Jesus loves us the way the Father loves him. And that is not something small and insignificant. In fact, it is the most significant thing of all. Can you even begin to imagine how much the Heavenly Father loves Jesus? You are loved with a love that is beyond measure, a love so great, so beautiful and all-encompassing, a love that desires only what is good for you and what will bring you fulfillment beyond your greatest desires. And Jesus then invites us in the gospel to remain or abide or dwell in his love. To remain means to abide in, dwell under, and be rooted in that love. Remaining in God's love. Remaining in his love makes us always aware of the fact that God's love is a free, undeserved gift. You can't earn it, and it's not a reward for good behavior. God doesn't think that way. God doesn't love me because I am good. He loves me because I am his. St. Francis de Sales said, God finds you lovable even in the midst of your greatest rebellion against him. So when we fail to live a life according to the mind of Christ or his commandments, it's not that God withdraws his love from us. It is we who withdraw ourselves from the love of God. Or rather, we have chosen to close ourselves off to his ever-available abundant love. Standing under an umbrella doesn't stop the rain. Your sin doesn't stop the outpouring of God's love. But God's love is everything we need, whether we are super holy or have wandered far off in sin. God's love is mighty. It is empowering healing, life-giving, redeeming, restoring, saving, merciful love. God desires us to always remain in his love. But his love has devised a way to return, a way back, should we have failed in love and even fallen in love with sin. We remain in God's love by doing what Jesus counsels us, by keeping his commandments. We return to his love by means of our repentance. And what is the fruit, the good thing, which comes from remaining in the love of God? Jesus tells us clearly, I have told you this so that my own joy may be in you and your joy be complete. What do you think is that which gives Jesus the most joy? In what does he rejoice most? Surely it must be that he is the Son of the Father, that he, as the eternal Son of God, is the recipient of the overwhelmingly beautiful love of the Father. This is surely Jesus' greatest joy. And he says that he desires that his joy, this same joy, would be in us. Surely he is pointing out to us that we must rejoice to be sons and daughters of God too. Love drove Jesus to die on a cross for you and for me, to open up for us a way to relationship with the Father. And not just any kind of relationship, a deep relationship that makes us the children of God. 
If you remember the quote from St. Paul that I mentioned earlier from Romans about the love of God poured into our hearts, well, in the letter to the Galatians in chapter 4, he says it again, but this time he, he speaks of the Holy Spirit who is love being poured upon us. He says, The proof that you are his children is that God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. We are loved by God, even in the midst of our sinfulness. That love of God calls us to union with him. Remaining in that union will require of us to live and act and move in love, which will show itself in that we keep God's commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus says. To sin is to wound this union in love, and with mortal sin, even to turn away from it altogether. But God is rich in merciful love. He does not forsake us. He does not treat us according to our sins. He loves us no matter what. But he loves us too much to sit idly by and watch us inflict great wounds upon ourselves by living lives beneath our dignity and unworthy of our great standing as the children of God. So he calls us to repentance and to be re-established in his love. And isn't that what the sacrament of confession does? And then, remaining under and in his great love, we will experience the joy of salvation, the joy of Christ the Saviour himself. For we will know ourselves to be loved by the God who is love, who loves to love us, who made us out of love, sustains us with his love, and desires to firmly establish us forever in the kingdom of his love, a kingdom opened up for us by the loving self-sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for you and for me. If you ever feel that you are too far gone, too sinful, too broken, too twisted for God to love you, then I invite you to look at the crucifix and see, behold, how much he loves you. In the psalm we heard, the Lord has shown his salvation to the nations. There on the cross, the Lord shows the love of the Saviour to you. Look at the sorrow of the Saviour on the cross, a sorrow he underwent so that his joy may be in you and your joy be complete. God love you. God loves you.